So the doctrine of preservation is a really important doctrine in the Bible, and I wanted to ask you why you believe the Bible is preserved today. Well, first of all, the Bible itself is the final authority. There's no greater authority that we could appeal to outside of the Bible and say, oh, well, I believe the Bible because of science, or I believe the Bible because of history, because the, you know, those things would then become the final authority. The Bible itself is the final authority, and the Bible claims to be the inspired, preserved Word of God. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But the doctrine of inspiration is completely worthless without the doctrine of preservation. Because what good is it for God to inspire His Word if it then goes away or becomes corrupted or changes over time. So the whole point of the inspiration of Scripture is so that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So I today in 2021, if I'm going to be truly furnished unto all good works, then I've got to have the Scriptures, the inspired Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so if it's inspired by God, then it has to be preserved by God in order for that inspiration to mean anything to me today. And obviously we have all kinds of promises within the scripture itself about preservation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It is easier for one, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one jot or one tittle to pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Give me a few verses that you think would really point to the idea that the Bible teaches mm -hmm. it's preserved, not just at the time that it's delivered, mm -hmm. but also for all generations and even today. Okay. Well, you can take a verse like in Proverbs where it says, every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's talking present tense and including scriptures that are much older. Or when we think about David saying in the Psalms, the law of the Lord is perfect. He's speaking several hundred years after the law was first given at Mount Sinai. And so we have all of these verses in the present tense talking about how God's word is pure. God's word is clean. Don't add to it. Don't remove from it. And he says that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. And so heaven and earth are still here, then God's word must still be preserved. Verses in the Bible uh, that, you know, make me believe in the doctrine of preservation would be like Luke 4.4, 4, where Jesus is being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and the devil's trying to uh, tempt Jesus by saying, command these stones that be made bread. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Uh, how could someone not uh, believe in the doctrine of preservation if we have to believe by every single word of God? Would you not say that that verse uh, is insinuating that we need every word of God in order to even fulfill daily life? Well, here's the thing. There are going to be Christians around the world who don't have every word of God in their language because unfortunately the entire Bible has not been accurately translated into every single language under heaven. Portions of God's word have been translated into these obscure languages. There could be some languages that only have the New Testament or maybe they just have certain books or parts of the Old Testament. And so not every Christian on this earth is going to have access necessarily to uh, all of God's words, and they could still grow and thrive with what they've got. But in order for the man of God to be perfect, what does perfect mean? Perfect means complete. In order for the man of God to be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, he's going to need all scripture. You know, if I, for example, were in a country where all we've got is the New Testament, and we haven't had the Old Testament translated into our language, I could still love God, serve God, win souls to Christ, preach sermons, pastor a church, but I'm going to be deficient on some things. Obviously, I would be able to do a much better job if I had all 66 books at my fingertips.
And you think about the people in the Old Testament, they didn't have as much as we have. So when God says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, obviously it's possible to live with whatever scripture that you've got access to. But if you're going to be perfect, if you're going to be truly furnished unto all good works, if you're really going to have the whole picture, you're going to have the whole book. And so you don't want it to be a Swiss cheese Bible with a whole bunch of things missing because whatever's missing, that's going to be doctrine that you're missing or, or wrong ideas you're going to get because you didn't see the whole picture. I don't want to see through a glass darkly. I want to see face to face. And so I want to have the entire Bible. I want to have an every word Bible so that I can be truly furnished unto all good works. When it comes to what is the Bible, some people would point to extra biblical books like the Apocrypha mm -hmm. or uh, even other texts and, and questioning what is the Word of God or how do we know exactly what Scripture is. How would you uh, explain to someone why you believe the 66 books that we have today in a King James Bible is exactly what God said and nothing else? Well, the first point that I would make is that the Bible must be self-authenticating meaning that it's not authenticated by some outside source of an expert or a church or history or science. It is self-authenticating. God's word authenticates itself. It proves itself to be God's word by its sheer magnificence. There's no other book like it. Never man spake like this man is what they said in the Gospel of John. And you could apply that to the entire Bible. And so there have been lots of imitations over the years. The Joseph Smiths of this world have written fake scriptures, and there's no new thing under the sun. Before the Book of Mormon, other bozos were writing other spurious scriptures. And how do we know that they're fake? Because they're garbage, because there's no power in them. The diamond can be distinguished from the cubic zirconia. And you don't necessarily even have to be an expert to tell the difference between, say, a pine tree and a cell phone tower that's made to look like a pine tree. One of them was made by God, the other is made by man, and there's a colossal difference. So when I look at the books of the Bible that are legit, I'm looking at a beautiful pine tree that God has made. And when I look at books of the Apocrypha, I'm looking at a dirty metal cell phone tower that's been dressed up to look like a pine tree. Going on what you're saying, the Bible teaches that a tree is known by its fruit. Mm -hmm. And what would you say the fruit is of a King James Bible versus all these other documents claiming to be the Word of God? Yeah, like, for example, you know, show me the great doctrinal position that came from an apocryphal book. Or, or show me the great soul winning movement that came from a series that was preached out of an apocryphal book. You know, people's lives haven't been changed by these books. They don't preach well. They're junk. They're worthless. What has God been blessing in our lifetime? What has God been blessing in recent history? It's been the preaching of the King James Bible. You know, throughout the 20th century, if you look at the great soul winning movements, if you look at the great preaching that was done, it was all done out of a King James Bible. And today, the churches that are the most aggressive about evangelism and winning souls and that have not just gone super worldly and compromised all their doctrine, the churches that are standing strong are the churches that are preaching out of a King James Bible. I got saved from a King James Bible. You got saved from a King James Bible. Millions of people out there got saved from the power of God's Word, and directly it was through a King James Bible that they encountered God's Word. And so that's the fruit of God's word right there is, is the people being saved, the churches that are going forward, the doctrines that are being preached, the lives that are being changed. You know, the, the book of Thomas didn't do that. Or I should say it's called the gospel, the gospel of Thomas. Of Thomas. Right? You know, the gospel of Thomas didn't do that. The gospel according to Bartholomew hasn't been used by God throughout history in that way. <clears throat> when it comes to the King James Bible, some people say it's just a translation, that the originals were obviously given in Hebrew, in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. We also have Greek as the primary underlying language for the New Testament. And some people will scoff at the idea of believing that the King James Bible is exactly what God said mm -hmm. because it's a translation. Right. What would you say to someone 
uh, who's questioning the mm -hmm. authenticity of a, a translation of God's Word. Here's what I would say to those who think that you have to go back to the original Hebrew or you have to go back to the original Greek in order to get the true meaning. God is the one who divided languages in the first place at the Tower of Babel. And God did not do that just to keep the vast majority of people in the dark and only reveal his word in these two languages to these really small groups of people. Because the vast majority of people in our world today don't speak Greek. They don't speak Hebrew. And even throughout history, it's not like the majority of people have spoken Hebrew at any time throughout history. So did God only ordain for his word to just go to these select few that are lucky enough to be born into these families that speak these languages? Absolutely not. Or a few scholars who would spend years of their life learning how to read this stuff? No, because God has shown throughout scripture that in whatever language his word is translated, it is still his word. Because for example, at the day of Pentecost, you have them speaking in all manner of different tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so that was God's word going into all these various languages at the day of Pentecost. Or you have, for example, Jesus Christ, who is an Aramaic speaker, quoting the Hebrew Bible, and then it's being written down in the Greek New Testament. And yet he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so that shows that it can go from Hebrew into Aramaic and then into Greek and then into English. You can still get the same meaning. And when, when the Bible says every word, we're talking about the meaning behind those words. Obviously, those words get translated from one language to another. But if I say cheese in English and I say queso in Spanish, it's not like, well, yeah, but you don't really get the full feeling until you get the word queso. It's like, that's just, the, that's just Spanish for cheese, buddy. Now, obviously, we could use it in a different context. There could be a different kind of cheese or whatever. But cheese is cheese, you know. Or, or if I said, for example, in Spanish, if I said, me llamo Esteban, and then in English I said, my name is Stephen, have I really lost anything in that translation? Because I didn't say, I call myself Stephen, right? Because literally, me llamo Esteban would mean, I call myself Stephen. But that's not what it means. It just means my name is Stephen, right? So I, if I said, my name is Stephen, I got the same thing across. It's not like, yeah, but you missed this hidden meaning of like, that's what you call yourself. That's how you identify yourself. But this is the kind of junk that you get with these people going back to the Greek and Hebrew, trying to find all these like nuances that aren't there. It'd be like that type of a logic that says, well, he didn't really say my name is Stephen. He said, I call myself Stephen. I wonder if that's even really his real name. But they don't understand that in Spanish, that's just how you say what your name is. You're not trying to imply anything like, well, I call myself Stephen. Not saying that's my name. But do you see what I mean? Like that's the kind of, it's kind of stupid stuff. An interesting point of the scripture is that it doesn't seem limited or locked into one language. As exactly. you pointed out, the Old Testament is obviously given in a different language than the yeah. New Testament, but even within the text itself, yeah. you see various languages being used, spoken, and even transcribed. Um, even in our King James Bible, uh, it'll literally point out different translations mm -hmm. in the text saying in this language, you know, it's a polyon and this language is a badon mm -hmm. or, you know, bringing up an interpretation in the book of Daniel or just basically telling us they were interpreting it, speaking another language. So would that not also point to the fact that the Bible itself transcends language yeah. and that we don't have to be limited to understanding God's word through one language? The biggest proof that God's word transcends a certain language and that it can be translated into another language without losing anything is the fact that God gave us the New Testament in Greek when the Old Testament was delivered in Hebrew. I mean, if it just had to be in that one language, then he would have given us the New Testament in Hebrew. But what does he do? He gives us the New Testament in a completely different language than the Old Testament, and then he quotes the Old Testament in the Greek New Testament. So he's translating stuff from Hebrew into Greek, but it's still God's word. It's still every word of God. It's still man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's a quote of a Hebrew scripture coming into Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic in his personal life from what we can see in scripture. And so 
the Bible transcends a certain language. Even when we talk about the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Hebrew of the Torah is a little bit different than the rest of the Hebrew of the books that came later. So there's even going to be a difference between the Hebrew of the late biblical period to the Hebrew in the Torah because language changes over time. So God's even delivering his word in the Old Testament in various styles or dialects of Hebrew, also Aramaic, and then you get in the New Testament, it's in a completely different language, Greek, because it doesn't matter what language it's in. That's why the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost could cause them to speak God's word in all manner of languages. And yet the same truth is there. And so I do not buy for one second this idea that you lose something in the translation of the Bible. If you are holding an accurate English Bible in your hand, you have all the information. There's, you don't need to read it in Greek to get some other knowledge or some hidden revelation. Your King James Bible in your hand will tell you what the original Greek says, what the original Hebrew says, and it's, it says the same thing. And if you spend years learning Greek and learning Hebrew because you want to get some new revelation or, or some deeper level of insight, you are going to be very disappointed because you're going to find out that it says the exact same thing that it says in English. The only thing that you're going to see in the original languages that you're not going to see in English are just plays on words. You know, there'll be words that sound alike right next to each other. Like he'll say, you know, pornea, poneria or something. You know, when he's giving those lists in, say, Romans 1 and, and he's listing sins and, and he'll talk about fornication and wickedness. You know, in English, it's fornication, wickedness. In the original, it's like pornea, poneria. You know, so it's like you'll get these kind of little plays on words, you know. Or, or if you're reading in the book of Genesis, for example, in Hebrew, then, you know, the, the, the same word for the serpent being subtle is the same word for naked that's used when they're naked and they're not ashamed. And then, and then you know, who told you that you were naked and all these. So there's little plays on words that are more just like a little fun thing. Like, oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that neat? Isn't that kind of poetic? But as far as the, the meaning, the doctrine, it's all there. There's absolutely nothing missing. Now, Muslims will often point to their original language for their scripture, mm -hmm. the Quran, and they'll elevate mm -hmm. the original language for the Quran as being superior. However, in Christianity, we see Christians often clinging to the King James Bible, uh, a translation of God's word over the original mm -hmm. texts. Um, we are obviously native English speaking people. You know, you and I both were raised in America. We speak English. Do you think that we uh, are biased towards the King James Bible um, as far as preferring it over the original languages? Or do you think there's some objective proofs as to why it's better to actually use the, the English King James Bible as opposed to maybe going back to the original text? Well, the King James Bible is obviously not superior to the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament because it's a translation of the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. If there were something wrong with those originals, then there'd be something wrong with the King James. You can't get a perfect translation from an imperfect source. That makes no sense. So the English Bible that we have, the King James Bible, is not superior to the Greek and Hebrew. But in practice, it's superior to a guy who only speaks English because he only speaks English. So to him, of course it's better because if I hand him a Greek New Testament, it's gonna do nothing for him. If I hand him a Hebrew Old Testament, he has no use for it. If I hand him the King James Bible, he's got everything he needs to live the Christian life and serve God. And so, yeah, the English Bible in practice is what matters to English speakers. The Spanish Bible is what matters in practice to Spanish speakers. But to say that the English is superior to the original Greek and Hebrew is absurd. And this idea is not new. These, these kind of over-the-top King James only is who believe that the English is superior to the original language, that's no different than the Roman Catholic Church who makes their final authority the Latin Vulgate. If you look at the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine, their final authority, as far as Scripture is concerned, is not the original Greek and Hebrew.
but rather the Latin Vulgate is their authoritative text. And most Catholic Bibles are translated directly from the Latin Vulgate. So, you know, back in the Reformation era, when the King James Bible was being translated from the Greek and Hebrew, and it came out in 1611, just a few years before that, you have the douay Reims version that was the Catholic Church competing with the King James. You know, they, they wanted to come out with their own version to compete with it. But the douay Reims Bible is translated from the Latin Vulgate. It's a translation of a translation. But then you could go back even further and go back to Augustine, who believed that the Old Testament shouldn't be the Hebrew Old Testament as the final authority. He said the Greek Septuagint should be the final authority. And so he trusted the Greek translation over the Hebrew original. And Jerome said, no, we got to go back to the Hebrew. And he won the argument. And so that's why the Vulgate is at least translated from the Hebrew in the Old Testament. But you see how this idea has always been around. You got the King James only people that take it too far because I'm King James only. That's the only modern English Bible that I would use. But yet you have the ones that are saying, no, 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 it corrects the Greek and Hebrew. It's superior to the Greek and Hebrew. This is just like the Catholics who said, well, the Vulgate's better than the original. Or Augustine who said the Septuagint's better than the original. No, wrong. The original is God's preserved word. And if you accurately translate the original into any language, it is still God's word. It is still inspired. It is still preserved. So is the King James Bible inspired? Yes, absolutely. Now, the Greek and the Hebrew of the original were immediately inspired, meaning directly inspired, whereas our King James Bible was not directly inspired. It's not like the translators wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The immediately inspired scriptures in the Greek and Hebrew are the basis for the inspiration in the King James. The King James derives its inspiration from the source. The, it, look, if you have an inspired Greek New Testament and then you translate it accurately into English, it's still inspired. It is the inspired Word of God because it is what God said. It is what God spoke. It doesn't matter what language it's in. As long as the same meaning is there, you have God's Word. If the King James was superior to the original Greek or Hebrew in the translation process, would that not mean that it was new inspiration? Yeah, absolutely. If someone were to say, oh, the King James Bible is superior to the original Greek and Hebrew, they'd basically be saying a couple things. They'd be saying that there's something wrong with the original Greek and Hebrew. And then they'd also be saying that there was some new revelation that came when the King James Bible was translated. And that is absurd. The King James Bible does not bring any new revelation. It is just translating what was already there. So it, the, the Word of God was already inspired long before 1611. And all the King James Bible is, it's the preservation of God's Word. It's not a re-inspiration or a new revelation. The King James Bible is the preservation of God's Word. It's a vehicle by which God has preserved his word for people who speak English. Many people would say that the King James Bible is the greatest literary work. What would be some evidences of the King James Bible being a greater work than any other complete literary work? Well, the first thing I would say is that obviously the Bible in general is the greatest work of literature of all time. And if someone were to say the King James Bible is the greatest work of literature. I think what they would be saying is that it's the greatest translation in the history of mankind from the original languages. And I would agree with that. I think that it probably is the greatest translation of God's word that has ever existed. I mean, it's impossible for me to say that for a fact because of the fact that I haven't seen every translation that was ever done in the history of mankind into every language on the planet. But I would say that it's the greatest translation in the history of mankind. People will say there's all kinds of religions out there. Right. And there's a lot of options yeah. when it comes to scripture. But myself and many others would claim that the King James Bible is the yeah. greatest literature to ever uh, exist in mankind's hands. Um, what would be some evidences of the fruit of the King James Bible being the greatest literary work? Well, 
The King James Bible has all the elements of great literature. It has great characters, it has poetic wording, it uses all kinds of literary devices like alliterations, rhymes, parallelism, and so it has a beautiful style. The content, of course, is amazing, and this is why there are people all over this world right now who don't even claim to believe the Bible, and yet they will spend years of their life studying the Bible in unbelieving universities with professors who are atheists or agnostics. I guarantee you that there are right now classrooms filled with students, none of whom believe the Bible, with a professor in front of them who doesn't believe the Bible, and they're discussing the Bible as literature right now. And in fact, that's probably happening in every major city in America because the Bible is even recognized by the secular world as one of the greatest literary works of all time. And even though I look at the Bible as a spiritual book and I read the Bible as the Word of God, I personally also enjoy studying the Bible as literature because I just like studying the Bible. And so it, looking at the Bible as literature is fascinating because it, it definitely is the best literature that's out there. But obviously to us it's much more than literature. It's the Word of God. Any way you look at it, the King James Bible has been the most important translation into English. There are all these other modern Bible versions that are kind of trying to get a piece of that pie and try to get a piece of that market. But the King James Bible is just this behemoth that has always been, ever since it came out, and, and you know all the way up until now, and maybe it always will be, the Bible that most people read. Because there was even a Pew Research poll that was done, and they showed that even though Bibles like the NIV might sell more copies, when it comes to people who actually read their Bible, they're overwhelmingly reading a King James. So there are lots of churches that preach out of the King James Bible. I would make the argument that the greatest churches, the soul winning churches, the ones who are preaching hard against sin, that, that you know, the churches that I would bother attending are, are all using the King James Bible. But not only that, even just a secular Pew Research poll showed that the Bible that most people actually read is the King James. Even if the NIV is selling more copies, okay, which one are people actually reading? Because people who actually read the Bible, you know, at least a couple times a week, minimum, they overwhelmingly use the King James Version. Now, I've heard you say, and I've heard a lot of other preachers say, the, the King James Bible has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And trying to put that into a quantifiable or more mm -hmm. practical observation, would you say that um, the power can be observed through maybe preaching? Mm -hmm. As far as have you heard any sermons from another version that ever inspired you or when it comes to the soul the soul winning efforts and fruits and products are you seeing that coming from other versions what would you point to as far as some real tangible evidences of the power of the word of god as far as being in the king james bible the king james bible has power and part of that is just because it's the word of god and the Word of God has power, period. But also, when we talk about the King James Bible having power, we would also point to the translation style, that it's not a weak, watered-down style that would kind of dull the edge of that two-edged sword. And you have these modern Bibles, and they kind of take the teeth out of Scripture by toning down the language, removing words like hell and damnation and brimstone. And, and these words evoke a response when you hear them because they're they're kind of hard-edged gritty words or, or even words like piss bastard things that basically would be removed because they're considered offensive but what what they end up doing is just creating a, a bible that's almost been kind of neutered or it's had its fangs removed it's just kind of weak instead of being the lion that is the word of god and so the king james bible specifically has power because of obviously the source material, it's the Bible, and, and also because of its style, its majestic style, its hard language.
And this comes across in sermons. When, when preachers are preaching from the King James Bible, it comes off a lot more authoritative or more powerful because of the language of the King James Bible. Using words like hell and damnation, it's just it, it's hard to really get fired up and, and preach hard about Gehenna and Hades because these are words that don't really mean anything to anyone. That's why they don't have power. Because if I, if I start talking to somebody about Gehenna and Hades, it, it doesn't really mean anything to them. It doesn't really evoke a, a response in them because they don't really feel that language because they don't really know what that means or it's, or it's not a word that they've associated with anything. Whereas we have so many negative associations with the word hell that when we hear the word hell, you know, right away it, it gets our attention. A lot of people will ask the question, well, where was the Bible before 1611? Or, or what English Bible existed before that? Well, the first thing we need to think about is the evolution of the English language itself. So around 1000 AD, we're talking about Old English, Anglo-Saxon, very Germanic language. And if you tried to read a sample of it, you would be able to understand almost nothing, okay? Then the French, invaded England and conquered with uh, William the Conqueror in 1066 AD. And then you had kind of a merging of that Norman French and, and Anglo-Saxon as the Normans ruled over the Angles and the Saxons. And then that hybrid language became what's known as Middle English, right? So from around 1150 AD to around 1450 AD, you would point to that as Middle English. And then as you get into the 1500s, now you're into modern English, okay? Now, the first modern English translation of the New Testament was done by William Tyndale. And he's one person, he did a phenomenal job, but obviously he's one person with limited resources, he was often on the run and a fugitive, he was eventually burned at the stake, he was not able to finish the whole Bible. He got the New Testament done, portions of the Old Testament, and so he basically provided the rough draft for our English Bible. Other people picked up the work where he left off. And pretty much every English Bible after that was a revision of William Tyndale because he's already started the process and, and produced the rough draft. So people coming after are, are honing what he's done and, and fine tuning it, constantly going back and looking at the Greek and the Hebrew and, and polishing and so forth. Well, the Bible that comes directly before the King James in this lineage is called the Bishop's Bible. And in fact, in the rules to the translators that King James laid out, he basically said that the King James Bible is going to be a revision of the Bishop's Bible. So he said, unless there's something wrong with it, go with what the Bishop's Bible says. Don't just change things for the sake of changing them, only change them to make them better. And he made it clear that the Bishop's Bible is the basis, not the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible. But he said in the instructions that they should look at the Geneva Bible and in places where the Geneva Bible is superior to draw from it and to look at other translations in other foreign languages, to look at all previous English versions, to look at foreign Bibles. But ultimately, the most important rule that he had for the translators was that all of the Old Testament must be translated from the original Hebrew, and all of the New Testament must be translated from the original Greek. So they're not translating from the Vulgate. They're not translating from a translation. They were to go back to the original languages and to compare with previous translations. Obviously, yeah, they looked at the Vulgate. They looked at other English Bibles. They looked at Spanish Bibles. But they translated from the Greek and the Hebrew, and they basically just improved, revised, polished, and fine-tuned what was already there in the Bishop's Bible. And the Bishop's Bible is a great Bible. It's just that some of the things weren't really expressed very eloquently in the Bishop's Bible. Not, not necessarily that the meaning was wrong or that the doctrine was wrong, but in a lot of places, the style just wasn't very smooth. And so the King James really kind of smoothed out a lot of those rough patches. And, and of course, there are some differences in meaning and wording between the two. But, I mean, the Bishop's Bible is 99%. King James Bible is 100%. As we see the English Bible going through this transitionary process of William Tyndale, 
the Matthew, Coverdale, we have Bibles like the Geneva and the bishops, and then ultimately a King James coming in a, a similar or somewhat rapid fashion from the perspective of history. Would you say that there was a compelling reason for each one of those revisions or new additions? I don't think that this was a rapid process at all because it really starts in the early 1500s and it culminates with the King James Bible in 1611. So it really took place over the course of almost 100 years because you have Erasmus coming out with his Greek New Testament in 1517, but then he came out with several editions after that and right away you've got guys like Tyndale and Martin Luther translating Erasmus's first edition. Other editions of Erasmus came out. Then come along guys like Robert Stephanus and Theodore Beza, who took Erasmus's work, edited it, fine-tuned it, polished it, corrected errors. And so this process of, of, of really honing in on the right Greek and Hebrew and honing in on the right English translation took almost a hundred years. I mean, if we look at the process of the King James Bible itself, it's a seven-year process. Fifty-four scholars, seven years. These guys are working on this full-time, some of the greatest minds that have ever existed, but yet they're not starting from scratch. They're building on work that had taken 80 years or so leading up to this. And so there's already so much work been done. The Bishop's Bible has already done so much of the heavy lifting. Before that, Tyndale had done a lot of the heavy lifting. And yet you have these seven guys, they've got a Bible that's 99% and they just need to take it across the finish line to 100%. And you've got seven years, 54 brilliant minds. So there's no rush. I mean, that's, that's really putting a lot of time and effort into something, almost 100 years. And yet, even just at that final stage, you've got 54 guys and seven years. Like, you know, an, an illustration that I was thinking of is when you look at how copper is mined from the earth and refined, it's pulled from the earth and then it's refined at a certain plant to get it 90%. Then they send it to another plant to get it to 99%. And then they send it to another plant whose only job is to take it from 99 to 99.9. Okay, because that's a big step right there. And so that's what the King James Bible is. The Bishop's Bible was already 99% and the King James Bible translators are taking a good translation and making it a great translation. When you point to the bishops as being a good translation and you say that the King James, they're making it better, in what ways are they making that better? Whether that be accuracy, linguistic prose, or what are you pointing to? Well, just to give you a famous example, in the book of Ecclesiastes, in the King James Bible, it says, cast your bread upon the waters, and you'll find it again after many days. Whereas in the Bishop's Bible, it says, cast your bread upon wet faces. And obviously, you know, that's an overly literal translation, and it sounds weird in English. And, and so a lot of people made fun of that and mocked that and would use it for an example of why they didn't like the Bishop's Bible. So even though the Bishop's Bible is the vast majority of the time doing a great job of accurately translating the underlying Greek and Hebrew, a lot of times it's just overly literal or not poetic. Uh, you, you could get the exact same meaning, but wet faces versus waters, <laughs> obviously, you know, obviously, if you throw your bread on the waters, you're throwing it on some wet faces, but that doesn't sound right in English, does it? It sounds crazy. So it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's mainly style. Would you say that they improved the accuracy of the text? Yes. They did improve the accuracy from the Bishop's Bible to the King James Bible as well, because there were a few little tweaks that needed to be made. But that's not the main thing that they did. The, the biggest thing that they did was just creating a better translation as far as the style. If someone were to read the Bishop's Bible out loud, let's say like the Gospel of, of John, maybe even a famous chapter like chapter mm -hmm. three, and someone who's really familiar with the King James Bible, how much would it sound different? If someone were reading the Bishop's Bible out loud, 
the vast majority of people would not be able to tell the difference between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Bible. You'd, you'd have to really know the scripture well to notice, hey, wait a minute, that's worded a little bit differently because it's very familiar. When you read the Bishop's Bible, if you know the King James, it's gonna be very familiar because most things stayed the same. How would that compare to the sound of a Bishop's versus the King James Whereas you have a King James and a modern version, like let's say an NIV, ESV. You know, my, my children, my children have participated in different homeschool activities around the valley here. And sometimes they'll hear Bible verses read in a modern version. And they always come home and, and kind of laugh at it and talk about how it sounded so off. And, and, and sometimes they're not even sure if it's the Bible that's being read because it's just so unfamiliar and things are worded in kind of a goofy way. And so it's kind of jarring to someone who really knows the King James Bible well to then hear one of these modern versions. It's, it's jarring, like, huh, really, what? Whereas if you compared the King James to something like the Bishop's Bible, there's not that big of a difference. A lot of people would say like, well, you know, the King James Bible translators, they were okay with these previous versions. So why aren't you okay with these modern versions? Why can't we have these other versions? The difference is that the versions that came before the King James pretty much said the same thing as the King James. Whereas these modern versions are saying something dramatically different. I mean, the difference between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Bible is very small. Whereas the difference between the King James Bible and the NIV is a giant leap. Those are not even comparable. It's apples to oranges. There must have been a, a compelling reason to at least revise the text and continually work upon the work of Tyndale mm -hmm. and, and get to the King James Bible. Why do you believe that uh, that stopped for several yeah. hundred years? That's a great point. You know, isn't it interesting that throughout the 1500s, you're continually seeing these new revisions come out of the English Bible as they keep fixing things and perfecting it and making it better. But then once the King James Bible came out, there was a very long period where it was just the translation. It was just considered done. And everyone knew that they could not surpass this thing because so much went into it that you're not gonna do a better job. And so for the longest time, the King James Bible was just the Bible. In fact, you'll find a lot of Bibles from that era, they don't even say King James Version on them. They just say the Bible because it was just understood this is the translation. And all of the previous translations eventually went out of print. Now, some of them are coming back into print because people want to read a Geneva Bible or a Bishop's Bible and check out what it said. But for a very long time, those versions were totally out of print because the King James just totally and utterly replaced them and was unchallenged for a very long time. The reason why the King James Bible started to be challenged again after just hundreds of years of being the only mainstream version, the only reason it got challenged was a whole new philosophy emerging in the 19th century a philosophy that said we've lost the text and we have to reconstruct it. We must do archaeology and, and we have to go back and find older manuscripts and, and we need to do textual criticism all over again and figure out what the Bible says because the traditional text is corrupt. That philosophy of the 19th century that said that the traditional text was corrupt, that's what led to these modern versions coming out. Because before that it was just, it's done. King James is done. But then it's like, oh no, what we've got is not what the original said. We need Westcott and Hort and all these guys to reconstruct the text. And this idea that we have to reconstruct the text is operating under the assumption that we've lost the text. Whereas we don't believe it's lost. We believe we've always had the Bible. We don't need to go dig it up somewhere. And these guys that are reconstructing the text, quote unquote, they will even tell you that it's impossible to get exactly what the apostles wrote. It's impossible to get back to the original autograph, but all we can do is just keep trying to get closer. Keep trying to get closer. And one of the absurd things about this is that when you don't know what the destination is, it's impossible to know whether you've gotten closer or further away.
How can you say, well, it's, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. You don't know where the destination is. Well, we've already arrived at our destination. We've got the King James Bible, and it is the preserved Word of God. It's the traditional text. It's the received text. It's what's been handed to us. It's been passed down. It's been continually used throughout history, whereas these new Greek and Hebrew texts that are being produced now, they don't even claim to be the true text. They claim to be closer. But how can you be closer when you don't know where you're going? <laughs> you know, how do you measure that? If the King James Bible... Think about that. If the King James Bible is exactly what God said in English, would there be a need for another translation or addition while the English language is stable? Because the King James Bible is a totally accurate translation of the original Greek and Hebrew into our English language, there is no need to revise it, to change it in any way. It's done. It's a finished product. The only possible reason that you would ever need to revise the King James is if our English language got so different to where people couldn't understand it anymore. Like, let's say in the year 2300 or something, our English language had changed so much that people couldn't understand it. Then at some point you'd be forced to revisit that gargantuan task of, of producing a perfect English translation. But we're not even close to that point. Would that be similar to just simply translating the Bible into a foreign language today, such as Spanish Absolutely. or into French, since the uh, listeners can't understand the English language or don't speak that language? It's not like you're changing the Word of God. It's already finished and locked in. But if language, uh, since it continually evolves, leaves the current modern English that we speak today in the dust, mm -hmm. there would be a need to allow the Word of God to flow into whatever new language is formed or adapted into. Exactly, because if, if you had a Latin Bible, and we're speaking Latin, and we've got a Latin Bible, and everything's great, and it's in the vulgar tongue, it's in everybody's language, but then hundreds of years later, that becomes Spanish, or that becomes Italian, or that becomes French, and those French people can no longer understand the Latin then you can't just say, well, we've got this great Bible in Latin. No, you'd say, no, we need it in French. So if English stops being English <laughs> and it becomes some other language down the road, then you'd have to translate the Bible into that language. But we're not even close to being to that point. The, the language that we speak today is close enough to the language of 1611 that we can easily preach from the King James, read the King James, even teach the King James to a little child. And they don't have any issue understanding it. Now, some people will say, well, I'm just having a hard time with it. Part of the reason you're having the hard time with it is just because some books in the Bible are just hard to understand. And it's not the language, it's just the text is hard. Not everything in the Bible is gonna be easy. And a lot of the words that people would accuse the King James of being archaic for using that word, there isn't really a modern word for it. Like, for example, take the word concubine. That's not a word that we use in our everyday vernacular, but what would you update it to? There's not really a concept of a concubine in our American society. So you can't really update that word. You have to keep the archaic word concubine because what else are you gonna say? There's no equivalent to that. Or, or like a word like a dowry or something. You know, we don't have dowries. So your average child on the street doesn't know what a dowry is, but you can't change it. I mean, there are all kinds of really specialized sewing terms, sailing terms, military terms, animal husbandry terms that are difficult in the Word of God. And people will somehow point to the King James as being too hard. It's like, well, no, you just don't know all the sailing terminology or, or sewing or husbandry. So the Bible is always going to have difficult passages. It doesn't matter what language you translate it into. Even if you brought it into the English of 2021, it is still going to have difficult passages. When it comes to translating anything, we all understand that telephone plays its part. And when you make a copy of a copy of a copy, there could uh, have more error.
So in the process of translating the Word of God, it seems like the best philosophy would always be to go to the source or the original as the King James. So in any new literary translation, even if the English language were to uh, adapt and change, would we not want to go back to the original Greek or Hebrew for that work to be done? <clears throat> If someone's in a situation where their only option is to do a translation of a translation, then that's definitely better than nothing. But if you have the choice, of course, you would go back to the original Greek and Hebrew when translating the Bible. And so let's say hundreds of years from now, we were translating the Bible into some modern variant of English that's become too different to understand. Then what you would do is you would translate directly from the Greek and the Hebrew, but you would have the King James Bible as a guide to look at. Just as the King James translators, they translated directly from the Greek and Hebrew, but yet they would look at things like the Vulgate as a guide. They looked at the Spanish translation as a guide. And since we believe and are 100% convinced that the King James Bible is an accurate translation, then obviously any translation that we did into any language would look at the King James and be advised by the King James, but it, it should ultimately translate from the Greek and Hebrew. But you'd still look at the King James, just as the King James looked at other translations. By the modern versions not using the same Greek and Hebrew of the King James, do you feel that that attacks the doctrine of preservation itself? Hmm. <clears throat> I think it's totally obvious that the people behind the modern versions do not believe in the preservation of God's Word. And the biggest piece of evidence for this is that they don't translate the Old Testament 100% from the Hebrew. There are places where they believe that the traditional Hebrew text is corrupt. So instead, they'll translate from the Greek Septuagint. They'll take a translation of a translation. That proves that they don't believe that every jot and tittle has been preserved. Because if you believed Christ's promise that one jot or one tittle would not pass from the law until all was fulfilled, then you would simply just translate the Hebrew Bible into English. But that's not what any of the modern versions do. What they do is they go back and they say, well, we're gonna translate from the Hebrew 99% of the time but in these places where we think the Hebrew is corrupt, we're going to go with what the Septuagint says. And that's why if you look at the footnotes of an NIV, it'll frequently say Hebrew says this. And I remember that used to perplex me when I was a teenager. Hebrew says this. I thought your whole job is to tell me what the Hebrew says. Isn't that what a translation is? But what they're saying is we didn't translate the Hebrew. We translated the Greek. But here's what the Hebrew says. So that right there shows you that they don't believe in preservation. Because if you believed in preservation, you'd be able to translate 100% from the Hebrew in the Old Testament because you'd believe it's there. You'd believe it's intact. But no, no, no. They believe that the Hebrew Bible is corrupt and that they have to draw from the Septuagint in order to repair the Hebrew Bible. Whereas the King James Bible is translated 100% from the Hebrew in the Old Testament because it's operating on the assumption that God actually preserved the Hebrew just like Jesus promised. In the footnote of a lot of modern Bibles today, you'll, you'll see a note or a reference saying that this is not contained in the original or the original says something different. What would we point to as the underlying Greek of the King James Bible? And what are the modern Bibles pointing to as the supposed underlying Greek? In the New Testament, the King James Bible is translated 100% from the Greek. Which Greek? They were using printed editions of the Greek New Testament that were published by Erasmus, Stephanus, and Biza. Now, they primarily used Biza's edition, and there are some very slight, very minor, very few differences between Biza and Stephanus. So sometimes they went with Biza, sometimes they went with Stephanus. But again, the difference between these two is very minuscule. And so the Greek underlying the King James Bible is not any one of those printed editions. 
but rather it's drawn from that whole family of printed editions of the Textus Receptus. So you have a guy in 1894 named Scrivener who published a Greek text that basically takes Biza's text and Stephanus's text and just basically marries them into one text based on what the King James Bible translators use. Some people will wrongly say, oh, it's back translated from the King James. It's not back translated into Greek. It's just basically a synthesis of Stephanus and Biza to basically give us exactly the Greek that went into the King James New Testament. Okay. Often people will put a number on the differences between Stephanus Greek New Testament and Biza's Greek New Testament. But when they say, oh, these are the differences, a lot of times they're literally counting differences that have zero impact on English or meaning. Like, for example, it'll be a word that's spelled differently, but it just has the identical meaning. Or in Greek, word order is not the same as in English, where word order is really important. In Greek, you can really get a lot more flexible with word order. So a lot of times, one edition will have these two words swapped, and the meaning is altered zero, not at all. And they'll count that as a difference. So really the difference between these editions of the Textus Receptus has been exaggerated and that they're virtually saying the same thing. There are very few meaningful differences between Biza and Stephanus. Many people criticize the King James saying it's not accurately translating the underlying Greek and they'll point to a modern version as tra translating it correctly. However, are they using the same Greek? Well, what's interesting about that is that throughout the 20th century, most churches and Bible colleges and professors were still using a King James as their English Bible, but they had switched to the Westcott and Hort Greek text. And so they would constantly be telling their students, oh, you know, the English Bible's wrong here. It should be this. Because they were literally using the Westcott and Hort style Greek to correct the King James, which is not even translated from those manuscripts. So obviously the King James is not going to line up with a Greek text that came out hundreds of years after the King James. So if you compare the King James Bible to the Greek Textus Receptus, it's going to match. But if you compare it to a corrupt Greek text, of course it's not going to match. But that's literally what Bible colleges and seminaries were doing throughout the 20th century. They're brainwashing these preacher boys by saying, oh, look, see what it says in English? Now let me show you what it says in Greek. That's not even close. But it was a scam because they're showing them the Westcott and Hort Greek text and comparing it to the English King James. Those aren't the same thing. The King James is translated from the Textus Receptus. So, of course, it's not going to match this corrupt Greek text. So yeah, a corrupt English Bible is going to do a better job of matching a corrupt Greek text than the traditional English Bible is going to match the corrupt Greek text. But if you take the traditional English Bible and the traditional Greek text, they're going to match. Why is the underlying Greek of the King James different than the Westcott and Hort and later editions? The Greek text underlying the King James Bible has often been known as the received text or textus receptus because it's that which we received. It's been passed down. It's the traditional text that's been used by Christians throughout history. The modern versions are based on a completely different philosophy where they've unearthed or discovered older texts that nobody was using. So these are texts that had been abandoned, texts that had been discarded. But they dug these things up and said, well, these are older. Therefore, they must be more reliable. And so it's not based on a philosophy that God preserved his word. Because if we believe that God preserved his word and that it's been preserved throughout the generations, then we would not go seek a Bible that's been buried. And, and have to go rediscover the Bible because we don't believe the Bible was ever lost. We believe that throughout Christianity, the Bible has been preached and, and souls have been saved through the power of God's word. We don't believe that God allowed his word to get discarded, abandoned somewhere, and that we need some German philosopher or some atheistic scholar to rediscover it and reconstruct it for us.
if someone believes the Word of God has been preserved and they're using a King James Bible today, what impact would a new archaeological discovery or some new text being unearthed do in the mind of someone that is already believing uh, that God's Word's been preserved in the English King James Bible? It would have absolutely no impact. It doesn't matter what they dig up over in the Middle East. It doesn't matter what is discovered. It will not change my belief on the Word of God whatsoever because philosophically, I believe that the true Word of God is not buried. It's out there doing God's work. It's out there being preached and taught in churches. It's not buried somewhere. So a new archeological discovery could not and would not change my mind about the Word of God. Whereas those who believe in the modern versions, a new archeological discovery could completely revolutionize their view of God's Word to the point where they would completely change their Bible. They would dramatically change their Bible. And in fact, James White was asked the question, if there's any verse in the Bible that is for sure locked in to where no discovery could change it. And he basically answered that every verse is up for grabs. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, so if, if you are part of this modern version crowd, Bible of the Month Club, then your Bible could be dramatically changed next year by some archaeological discovery that's made. Newer, better, older, better, more reliable. Whereas for us, the text is locked in. Our Greek text is locked in. Our Hebrew text is locked in. We're not changing. Whereas the Nestle Aland is on the 27th edition, soon to be the 28th edition, the 29th edition. Do you think it's going to stop there? No. They're not even claiming that it's going to stop there because even in the 29th edition, using the new CBGM, Coherence-Based Genealogical Method, they've only applied that to a small fraction of the books of the New Testament. And they're saying, hey, in the 30th edition, we're going to apply this new method of textual criticism to even more books. And then in the 31st edition, we're going to make even more changes. They're already planning multiple new editions that are going to make serious changes to the text. And these changes to the text, they change the meaning. Sometimes they can make a verse literally say the opposite of what it used to say. And it will never end. There's no end in sight. These Bibles just keep on changing. You know, the editors of the ESV claimed that this last version of the ESV was the final version. And literally, it was just a matter of months before they announced, we're working on another one. So it's never going to stop. Whereas our Greek and Hebrew text is fixed. Now, if hundreds of years from now, the English language ceases to exist as we know it and, and, and morphs into something else, and we have to go back and translate, you know, we would still use the same Greek and Hebrew text underlying the King James, and we would still look at the King James as our model of the greatest translation in the history of mankind. And that would be the basis as far as the style. You know, we would try to, to recreate the greatness of it. We wouldn't go back and reinvent the wheel. So we have a stable text. These modern version people do not have a stable text. The modern versions compared to the King James have a lot of uh, major differences. Many verses are missing. Um, they have been taking out whole phrases. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like a very different text. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that alteration is not just simply an attack on the King James Bible's accuracy, but even the preceding versions, which contain many of those verses, and simply even the doctrine of preservation itself? Yeah, a lot of these new readings are going to be unique in history in the sense that they're not just saying that the King James is wrong. They're saying that all the versions leading up to the King James are wrong. Because if Bibles throughout history have read one way, and then all of a sudden these new versions change it to read a completely different way, it's not just, oh, well, it reads different than the King James. Often they end up reading different than all English Bibles in the history of modern English. Do modern versions show a lack of confidence in the accuracy of God's Word when they skip numbering, when they add 
or they remove verses from the text and or they even put footnotes claiming that whole sections are not even in the more reliable manuscripts. Does this not put some kind of a doubt to the preservation of the Word of God and weaken the uh, authenticity of Scripture? Well, this is the hypocrisy of the modern versions that they put a note saying that the long ending of Mark is spurious or that the woman taken in adultery shouldn't be there. And the people who put out these modern versions, they do not believe that those are authentic. So then you have to ask yourself, why did they even print them in the first place? They printed them because you can't sell a Bible without the woman taken in adultery. You can't sell a Bible without the long ending of Mark because people would freak out if those whole chunks are missing. They want them to be there. They want their Bible to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so these hypocrites basically put something in that they believe is fake so that they can sell it to you, but then they put a note saying, oh, well, you know, this woman taking adultery story is probably not in authentic, and it's not in the oldest, most reliable manuscripts. And they're really just talking about, typically they're just talking about two manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, but they make it sound like it's just so many manuscripts don't have it. But the long ending of Mark is attacked, uh, the real ending of Mark, I should say, uh, the woman taken in adultery, all these other verses, but yet they print them, yet they number it as if they're there because of the fact that Christians, God's people throughout history, have embraced these things as God's word. The Holy Spirit has borne witness in the hearts of God's people throughout the history of Christianity that this is authentic, this is God's word overwhelmingly that's been the consensus and even today overwhelmingly people want that in their Bible which is why they have to print it but they're trying to like wean you off of it by putting this note and the Jehovah's Witness Bible did the same thing for a long time the Jehovah's Witness Bible just had a note about the long ending of Mark and literally only in the last 10 years has the Jehovah's Witness Bible gone all the way and deleted Mark 16 9 through 20 until 10 years ago, it was there. But they were weaning you off of it, putting all the notes. And that's what these new versions are trying to do. They're trying to destroy people's faith in these passages that have been traditionally accepted and embraced by spirit-filled Christians. And spirit-filled pastors have gotten up and preached whole sermons out of Mark 16 and John chapter 8. I mean, come on, John chapter 8, that's a popular passage about the woman taken in adultery. It's been the, the, the subject of so many sermons, right? led by God, led by the Holy Spirit, but yet they don't believe in it. Why would you trust someone to translate the New Testament for you who rejects the story of the woman taken in adultery, who rejects the ending of Mark 16, who believes in a gospel of Mark that ends with them being scared and not telling anybody? It doesn't even make sense. And, and I've, I've preached about how if you take out 9 through 20, the ending doesn't make sense and it becomes a lie is what it becomes. And so that ending at verse 8 is absurd. But just keep in mind that even though they printed verses 9 through 20, they told you in the column that they don't believe in it and they are weaning you off of it because they want to change these Bibles even more. But they can only change it so much at a time without freaking people out. It's like the frog in the hot water. So they slowly begin to remove things. They slowly cast doubt on things. And then they say, well, we gotta make it a little more gender neutral. So, you know, the NIV in 1984 is one thing, but then you got the 2011 NIV. What's the big change from 1984 to 2011? The big change is that now the NIV has become more gender neutral in 2011. Well, this isn't really the time or the place to get more gender neutral with the Word of God in 2021 America with the things that we're dealing with? You really think that that's the change that we need to be making? But isn't it interesting how these Bibles are changing with the times, changing with the culture? I mean, hmm, just a coincidence that the Bible was fine for hundreds of years in English, but now all of a sudden in 2011, we got to make it gender neutral. Hmm, I wonder what's driving that agenda. Could it be the gender bending weirdos that are taking over our society? I mean, how can that be a coincidence that we're in this gender-confused culture in 2011 and boom, 
this is the change that they've decided to make to the Word of God. That's not a coincidence. That is their agenda coming through because they want to sell more Bibles. Who do you believe is responsible for preserving the Word of God? Is it God or man? And if there is all these changes, mm -hmm. who would be the ultimate party, you know, interested in, in tampering with the Word of God? Well, think about the way that God gave us His Word in the first place. He used people to do it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So even though man wrote down the Bible, it was still orchestrated and directed by God. And I think preservation is similar in the sense that obviously human beings are the ones that are copying it and printing it and publishing it and distributing it. But at the end of the day, it is ultimately God who is responsible for preserving his word. God is the one who made the promise that it would be preserved. And so God in his providence has worked throughout history. He's worked in the hearts of people. He's worked through circumstances and events to make sure that his word was preserved. It's not just human beings responsible for it because human beings will mess up whatever they do unless God is somehow supervising or guiding. So, and I would say the same thing about the King James Bible translation itself. Obviously, there was no new revelation in 1611. The King James Bible translators were not immediately inspired by God or, or the, the translation itself was not immediately inspired. But obviously, God's hand of providence is there in assembling the right team because God knew that English was going to become the most important language in the world, the global universal second language, the language of the most missionaries and pastors and soul winners and, and people that would take the gospel all over the world. And so God, in his providence, in his wisdom, helped orchestrate the circumstances to get the right minds and the right people. And then you have the translators themselves praying to God, asking for wisdom, and I believe that God answered that prayer so that they were able to produce an accurate translation, a magnificent accurate translation of the Bible into English. But at the end of the day, it's God who ultimately both inspired his word and who preserved his word and continues to preserve his word. He will work through history to make sure that his word does not cease to exist. In the Bible, we're not only introduced to good characters, but also evil. And that's epitomized with the devil himself. In the Garden of Eden, uh, his first words that we learn of is, Yea, hath God said. Do you feel like that's a common theme throughout the Bible as far as the devil trying to attack the Word of God? And do you believe that that would have any influence on translations? Absolutely, because the most important thing that we have as Christians is our faith. And what is the devil doing when he says, Yea, hath God said? He's casting doubt on the Word of God. We have faith in the Word of God. And so these are the two things that are warring against each other. The devil on one side who wants us to doubt what God actually said. Did God really say that? I mean, you're reading it in English. Is that really what God said? versus the Holy Spirit whose fruit is faith. And the closer we are to God and the more spirit-filled we are, the more faith we're going to have in God's word. And the devil on the other side of that wants to cast doubt on his word and, and, and cause us to wonder whether this is really what God said. And here's the thing. If we all believe that when the Bible was originally written, it was God's perfect word, but then we start doubting whether it still says what it used to say. I mean, you know, the devil has succeeded at that point. If he can get us to wonder whether what we actually have in our hand is even God's word, well then, you know what? He has succeeded at the same garbage that he was pulling in the, in the Garden of Eden. By the modern translations saying something completely different than the King James, both can't be true. And if the devil's goal is to disarm Christians, do you see modern versions as a tool of the devil to take the sword, which is the word of God, out of Christians' hands so they can no longer attack him? 
obviously we are at war spiritually and the devil is called our adversary. And so if the devil can disarm his adversary, he's going to do it. And we know what the weapon is. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so obviously if that's the offensive weapon, the word of God, and the devil's our adversary, of course he would love to take that sword out of our hand and replace it with some weak, watered down, ineffective weapon. He'd love for our sword to be shorter. He'd love for it to be dull. He'd love for it to be brittle and break and fail and not stand up to the battle because he's our enemy. I mean, do you want your enemies to be armed with the most powerful weapons or would you rather swap it out for some garbage weapon? And, th and that's what the devil has been doing over the years is, is taking the two-edged sword of the King James Bible out of the hands of Christians and replacing it with a butter knife called the ESV, you know, a butter knife called the NIV, instead of the weapon that can actually do some serious damage, you know, he wants us to be fighting with garden tools. He wants us to be fighting with a shovel and a pitchfork and a garden hoe instead of fighting with a sword, a battle axe, you know, you, you know what I mean? In scripture, you have the example of the Philistines making it illegal for the children of Israel to have weapons. And if you remember the battle where Saul and Jonathan were the only ones who actually had a sword, the rest of the Israelites had to use gardening equipment or farming equipment. They're grabbing shovels, pitchforks, hoes, mattocks, and they're using those inferior weapons against a military force that's armed with real weaponry, swords, axes. So obviously the devil, he doesn't want us to have the real weapon, the King James Bible, the Word of God, the two-edged sword. He wants us to have some cheap imitation, some watered down version that is not going to have the same sharp cutting edge and we're not going to be as effective if we don't have the sharp weapons. When the King James Bible was translated in 1611, there's many other editions that came out after 1611 to correct things like typographical errors or perhaps even different printing or publishers uh, would alter spellings of names and different words. And some people throw out statistics out there saying, oh, the King James Bible changed thousands of times until it got to the 1769 version. What would you say to someone who criticized the King James Bible because of all of these changes? Or what were these changes? Well, first of all, typographical errors can't be blamed on the translators because the translators did their job correctly. Printers and machinery and that process end up making mistakes. And, and virtually every book on the shelf at Barnes and Noble, if you look hard enough, you can find a typo in it somewhere. So the original edition of the King James Bible had typos in it that were corrected over the years. Also, another thing that's been corrected over the years are just spellings and punctuation. And you can't even really call it corrected because sometimes these things just change over time. You know, in, in 1611, spelling wasn't really as strict as it is now. You could kind of spell words a few different ways and it was all considered correct. Whereas today we have this mentality that says only one spelling is correct. So over the years, the King James Bible has had typos fixed, spelling changes, punctuation changes, capitalization rules have changed and so forth. But the meaning, the text, the wording is still the same as what the translators translated. So if you read it out loud, it would still say the exact same thing, except for a few typos. But again, you can't blame the translators for the typos. That's just a printing error. And that's just because human beings are printing the book and, and make mistakes. But when I hear people give these bizarre numbers like 22,000 errors in the King James, this is so absurd because there are only 31,000 verses. So are we supposed to believe that literally like every verse and a half in the King James is just wrong? But what it is is that they're trying to snow you with this huge number instead of actually pointing you to a verse and saying, here's the error, they just snow you at 22,000 because then they expect you to think, well, one of those has to be a real error. 
But it's it's bizarre. It's dumb. Or or the the King James Bible has been changed in twenty two thousand places. Like what? So does that mean like almost none of it's the same? There's only thirty one thousand verses. But this is what they're saying. One word in a verse gets a spelling change, K off the end of music or something, boom, that's a change. So yeah, if you count every little spelling change and every little uh, comma or whatever, then okay, you could get 22,000, but that's not errors. That's just, we're spelling things differently now. And when you read a King James Bible in the actual 1611 replica, it takes a few minutes to get used to the spellings because the spellings are dramatically different. But once you've read it for like 20 minutes, all the, you, oh, okay, I get it. You know, oh, this U is actually a V. The J's look like I's. You kind of just figure out a few rules and then boom, you can read the thing. But these people are, are, are just completely blowing things out of proportion and, and twisting things to make it sound like the King James keeps changing. And that's why we keep a replica at the back of our auditorium of the 1611 King James. So nobody could pull that jazz in our church, claim, oh, hey, this is totally different than the original 1611 edition, because I would just say, okay, well, let's go look at it. Let's take your modern King James and let's put it next to the replica, and you know what you're gonna see? Aside from a few typos that are known and understood to be typos, it's gonna say the exact same thing. Believing the King James Bible is the Word of God, I believe is a great doctrine, but sometimes it seems like people can take a really great doctrine overboard or a little too far. And the Bible teaches that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if the King James 1611 spells things differently than my, you know, 1769 version that I have in, you know, my hand right now, at the same time when I read them out loud, no one will be able to tell the difference. Therefore, does it make sense when people bring up this argument of saying that by altering the spelling of words, it's corrupting the text, or by shifting something like speaketh to speaks would be a corruption of the text? What would you say to people that seemingly are getting a little overzealous? I mean, that, that argument is so absurd. It's hard to believe that anyone would actually be that foolish to think that changing the TH to an S or spelling something differently would be corrupting God's word. I mean, it's, it's bizarre that anyone thinks that because we have to remember that this is a translation from Greek and Hebrew into English. And so it's not like God took his finger and wrote in stone tablets and spelled things a certain way. I mean, when we translate it into English, we want to get the meaning of the original. And so if color is spelled C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R, to sit there and say, well, if you get rid of that you, you've corrupted the text. I mean, it's almost not even worth addressing that point because it's so absurd. It's hard to believe that anyone would actually be that ridiculous, but it's out there. And it gives all of King James only as a bad name. When you have people just giving these bizarre statements, if you change speaketh to speaks, you've corrupted God's word. I mean, that's lunacy. And it makes all of King James onlyism just look stupid at that point. When in reality, King James onlyism is the position that makes sense. But not when you listen to these bozos who are saying, the King James is superior to the Greek and Hebrew. You can't even change a spelling. You can't even change a comma or a parenthesis. It's like that, that, that's so bizarre in light of the fact that it's an English translation from the original Greek and Hebrew. It's hard to believe that anybody actually thinks that way. If someone were to take this over-the-top approach, would they not have to condemn all the previous English versions since they clearly alter words, use synonyms, or even adjust the order in which the, the verse is structured yeah. while keeping the exact same meaning? And not only that, they would, they would end up condemning every foreign language Bible on the planet and basically saying every foreign language Bible is wrong because it's not worded exactly like the King James. Because it's impossible to word things exactly like the King James in a foreign language because foreign languages word things differently. So when the Bible says every word, it doesn't mean we translate word for word because the King James is not a translation that's word for word from the Hebrew or the Greek. All you have to do to debunk that stupidity 
is to just look at the places where the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. And you know what you're going to notice? That it'll use a different word that means the same thing. It'll say the same thing, but it won't use the exact word. According to these people, that's just a horrible corruption because they've taken a good doctrine and just taken it way overboard. And I think it's frankly because they never understood it in the first place. So because they don't understand the doctrine, they're posers pretending that this is what they believe. So therefore they get it wrong because they, they're, they're fake. When you see these people taking an absurd position on the King James, it's because they're fake. They, they're not actually understanding and believing the doctrine. They've heard what the doctrine is, that we believe the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved word of God. They don't understand that. They don't know why we believe that. So in their fakery, pretending to believe that, they get it wrong. Yeah, don't even change the TH to an S. Don't even spell things different. It's like, huh, what? It'd be like if I tried to pretend to be something that I'm not. If I tried to be some skater dude, you know, if I just went and bought a skateboard right now and went to the skate park tonight, you know, I could kind of walk up and maybe pretend like I knew some of the slang, some of the lingo, some of the moves. But then when I get on the skateboard, it's gonna become pretty obvious that I don't know what I'm doing. And that's like these guys, they're posers. You know, they're, they're pretending that they believe this and understand it, but they clearly don't believe the, the biblical doctrines of inspiration and preservation. They, so then in their fakeness, they come up with some fake doctrine where basically the King James Bible translators are inspired by God, giving us a new revelation in 1611. The Bible re-inspired in English directly from God, Forget the Greek, forget the Hebrew, it just fell out of the sky in 1611. That's bizarre. And I think the people who teach that, they don't, they're just proving that they never understood or believed these doctrines. Some would find it hard to believe anybody who believed this or uh, adhere to this doctrine, but wouldn't we see teachings like from Peter Ruckman and a lot of his followers, even maybe people like Sam Gipp, actually come up with uh, ideas or, or uh, make statements comparable to this? Absolutely. And, and part of this also is just this one-upmanship of just, well, let me show you how King James only I can be. Oh, you're King James only? Well, I'm really King James only. And it's just this kind of pride-filled one-upmanship where they just keep getting more radical until it just becomes absurd. It just becomes <laughs> insane, right? Because if, if that's what you're trying to do, just keep one-upping and showing, and, and you're going to have a conference that's basically like King James only is reaching King James only is with King James only -ism to show how we're more King James than the King James guys. You know, that's what this is. It's just this kind of pride and one-upmanship of, I'll show you King James. You think you're King James? Well, let me show you how King James I am. I believe the red letters are inspired. And you know what? I believe Alexander Scorby's reading of it is inspired. The way he reads it is inspired. You can't even pronounce things differently than Alexander Scorby, or you're not King James only enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, you could just take it further and further. Like, if it's in red... If it's in red, the red letter, that's what Jesus said. And if, the, if it's not in red, he didn't say it because the red font is inspired. And the italicized words, if they're not in italics, you've corrupted God's word if you put an italicized word in a normal font. And if you, if you pronounce it different than Scorby pronounces it, you're corrupting God's word. 